Well, tonight we're going to do a quick prophecy update uh, since because of time we don't have time to get into uh, Revelation 17, but we will definitely be getting into Revelation 17 uh, next week and probably for another week or two after that, uh, Revelation 17 and 18, so you might want to read ahead on that. Uh, as you know, we talk a lot about the future in here and the things that are going on in the world that some people consider very troubling. Uh, this is a view of... Uh, the world, the important part of the world from a prophetic standpoint, that's the nation or that's the Middle East, looking at it from the north, sort of the Russian view. You can see Israel there highlighted in red. And I just thought that this was an interesting perspective to give people a little different view of how, to how other people might see the world. One of the things we also point out in here quite a bit is that there is this convergence of events. A lot of the things that the Bible says will take place in the tribulation period uh, or before the tribulation period are already uh, coming to fruition. Uh, the rise of various nations against Israel, the economy, transhumanism, and the nations aligning just like the Bible said that they were. Not sort of like the Bible said that they would, but exactly like the Bible said that they should in the end times. Here's a update. So let's look at an update. First, we'll look at the church. Then we'll look uh, at some transhumanism issues. Then we'll look at uh, an article by Caroline Glick that discusses Syria, Iran, and the Palestinian issue, uh, all of them which I think are very important for, from a prophetic perspective. Here you see a page or a screenshot of a page from Benny Hinn Ministries talking about how if you just uh, give money to Benny Hinn, uh, you may even have to go into debt to do it, but if you give money to Benny Hinn to help him get out of debt, you're going to get out of debt yourself. Uh, this is a typical con job, money preacher thing that they do all the time to get you to give money. And this is just another example of it. Why people continue to give to these ministries is beyond my comprehension. Well, this week, President Obama uh, went to Planned Parenthood. I believe he was the first president to ever address Planned Parenthood. And here's a couple clips from his speech to Planned Parenthood. So the fact is, after decades of progress, there's still those who want to turn back the clock. The policy is more suited to the 1950s than the 21st century. And they've been involved in an orchestrated and historic effort to roll back basic rights when it comes to women's health. 42 states have introduced laws that would ban or severely limit access to a woman's right to choose. Laws that would make it harder for women to get the contraceptive care that they need. Laws that would cut off access to cancer screenings and end educational programs that help prevent teen pregnancy. In North Dakota, they just passed a law that outlaws, uh, outlaws your right to choose starting as early as six weeks, even if a woman's raped. A woman may not even know that she's pregnant at six weeks. In Mississippi, a ballot initiative was put forward that could not only have outlawed your, uh, outlawed your right to choose, but could have had all sorts of other far-reaching consequences, like cutting off fertility treatments, making certain forms of contraception a crime. That's absurd. It's wrong. It's an assault on women's rights, and that's why when the people of Mississippi were given a chance to vote on that initiative, they turned it down. And Mississippi is a conservative state. Mississippi is a conservative state, but they wanted to make clear there's nothing conservative about the government injecting itself into decisions best made between a woman and her doctor. And folks are trying to do this all across the country. When you read about some of these laws, you want to check the calendar. You want to make sure you're still living in 2013. <laughs> Forty years after the Supreme Court affirmed a woman's constitutional right to privacy, including the right to choose. We shouldn't have to remind people that when it comes to a woman's health, no politician should get to decide what's best for you. 
No insurer should get to decide what kind of care that you get. The only person who should get to make decisions about your health is you. That's why we fought so hard to make health care reform a reality. And what you're going to see, folks, is you're going to see more and more people calling people who hold conservative traditional values extremists, turning back the clock, going back to the 50s, wanting to oppress women, wanting to reinstate slavery. All of these types of claims, they're false, but they're going to increase as we get closer to the return of the Lord. There will be a more and more of an attack on conservative truly conservative, Bible-believing, evangelical Christians. In fact, I just saw something else today where I believe Mark Driscoll, a pastor at Mars Hill in Seattle, was calling Christians extremists uh, based on some of the views that they have. And I believe the editor of Charisma Magazine also joined in and said the same thing on his blog. So this is going to increase. So here's uh, the conclusion of President Obama's speech to Planned Parenthood. As long as we've got a fight to make sure women have access to quality, affordable health care, and as long as we've got to fight to protect a woman's right to make her own choices about her own health, I want you to know that you've also got a president who's going to be right there with you, fighting every step of the way. Thank you, Planned Parenthood. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. Well. That's really an abomination that he would go to in the in the midst of the Gosnell trial where a guy slaughtered babies that were born alive, snipped their spinal cords, and for President Obama to now go to an organization that really ultimately supports late-term abortions and that type of activity is really, in my view, an abomination. But... It's what do we expect, and I believe that God's judgment is going to fall on our country because of people like President Obama. Here's what somebody said he should have said. As long as we've got to fight to make sure women have access to doctors who will kill their unborn children, and as long as we've got to fight to protect a woman's right to have her unborn, children, unborn, unborn child killed, I want you to know that you've also got a president who's going to be right there with you fighting every step of the way. Thank you, Planned Parenthood. God bless you. That's really what he was saying. Here's an editorial cartoon that says, uh, this is what President Obama said when speaking in favor of gun control. If there's a step we can take to save even one child, we should take that step. But he goes to Planned Parenthood, it's essentially never mind about the children. Uh, this is something that will affect our country eventually. Here's another troubling statistic. 50% of young Christians now support legalizing pot. And I think there's a blog post running around out there that says that Jesus used cannabis or pot, uh, and, and that's how he healed some of the people that he healed. Uh, this stuff is nonsense. This stuff has no factual basis, and when somebody makes a claim like that, Jesus using pot to heal people, uh, then you understand why they call this stuff dope. The cover of Time Magazine, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Now, we've been talking about transhuman in, transhumanism in here over the last few years. Martin Erdman, Patrick Wood have come and talked to us about those topics uh, here is a new website that's just been put up called 2045.com. And the things that they propose accomplishing over the next uh, series of years, like from 2015 to 2020, they will accomplish a robotic copy of a human body remotely controlled via BCI. And then 2020 to 2025, an avatar, that's a representation of a human being in which a human brain is transplanted at the end of one's life. Then 2030 to 2035, an avatar with an artificial brain in which a human personality is transferred at the end of one's life. And then finally, 2040 to 2045, a hologram-like avatar. Here's a video from the 2045 website. 
It is clear that today's revolution will also require the deepest social transformation. The world's community and leaders should encourage mankind, instead of wasting resources on solving momentary problems, to focus on the technologies of the future, nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, cognitive technology, genetics and robotics. Doing so will allow us to find new sources of energy, create fundamentally new architecture and transportation, allow unprecedented developments of human cognitive abilities, refine artificial intelligences and brain-computer interfaces, simulate complex systems, create humanoid robots and cyborgs, and with the help of nanorobots, we may develop manageable matter. Find ways to transfer one's personality to an artificial carrier. Yet what we need is not just another technological revolution, but a new civilizational paradigm. We need new philosophy and ideology, new ethics, new culture and new psychology, and even new metaphysics. We must reset our limits, go beyond ourselves, beyond the Earth and beyond the solar system. This is an adequate response to the challenges of our time. Thus, new reality and future man will arise. 2035. The first successful attempt to transfer one's personality to an alternative carrier. The epoch of cybernetic immortality begins. 2040 to 2050. Bodies made of nanorobots that can take any shape arise alongside hologram bodies. 2045 to 2050 drastic changes in social structure and in scientific and technological development. All the prerequisites for space expansion are established. For the man of the future, war and violence are unacceptable. The main priority of his development is spiritual self-improvement. A new era dawns. The era of neo-humanity. Well, that has a very much a Tower of Babel type uh, quality to it, that we're going to become as gods. We're going to transplant our personality into something else, and we will become immortal. And you can listen to the people like Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the leading proponents of this. He's working for Google. Uh, he believes that people will, man will become immortal. And 2045 is the target date. Uh, here's some news about the Middle East. First, let's look at Syria. Uh, yesterday or two days ago, the Israeli Air Force shot down a drone that came from Lebanon. Hezbollah has denied that this was its drone, but it's really the only place that it could come from. A lot of people are questioning why Hezbollah would take on Israel at this time. Uh, by sending a drone down into its airspace. And the reason when this one uh, garnered so much attention was that as it was entering Israeli airspace, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was in a helicopter flying someplace. So the Israeli Air Force shot down the drone. Hezbollah says it was not ours. You should know that Hezbollah is under tremendous pressure. It's a Shiite uh, Islamic group that controls, virtually controls Lebanon but they're dependent on support from Syria and Iran. And of course, Syria is now being overrun by a lot of Al-Qaeda rebels. Those are Sunni. Another place you should look, This we don't have time to talk about it this week, but another place that's sort of a hot area is Iraq, where the Saudis are funding Sunni insurgents in uh, Iraq. The Iranians are funding Shiite insurgents in Iraq. That is the fault line of the divide in the Islamic world. Uh, you see it in other places. There's the Shiite-Sunni divide in Lebanon, Hezbollah, and Syria with the, the rise of the Al-Qaeda rebels. Uh, Assad is an Alawite. That's a sect that is more, I think, related to Sunni Islam. But this is these are areas you're going to see a lot of conflict in these areas. And at some point the situation may get bad enough that Israel's going to have to do something. And one of the things that might cause it to do something is this chemical arms. 
Uh, these are headlines from the uh, Daily Star and other places. Uh, the Jerusalem Post about sarin gas being used in Syria. Now, everybody said that this was a red line if chemical weapons were used by the Assad regime, that something would have to be done. And now there's evidence, everybody's pretty much in agreement that sarin gas was used at least on a limited basis. And of course, our president is sort of running for cover now because he says he still needs confirmation, even though everybody's given him proof. These are, this is a, a Stratfor map of the various chemical weapons facilities within the nation of Syria. Uh, you'll note that there are some of them right in the area around Damascus, which may have prophetic significance looking at Isaiah chapter 17. Caroline Glick. Caroline Glick is one of the great columnists of the world. I appreciate the fact that she is willing to take a stand and confront people with the truth of what's going on in the world. I wish there were more columnists like her. She is, in my view, almost a modern-day Deborah, who you can read about in the Book of Judges. I also appreciate Caroline because she helps me get my prophecy update together sometimes, and she says it a lot better than I do. I'm going to read extensively from her column that was in the Jerusalem Post on Thursday the 25th or Friday the 26th. Uh, it's a column that everyone should go read. You can go to carolineglick.com and get a copy of it. But here's what she said. A short summary of events from the past three days. On Tuesday morning, the head of the IDF's Military Intelligence Analysis Division, Brigadier General Etay Brun, revealed that the Syrian government has already used lethal chemical weapons against Syrian civilians and opposition forces. Brun described footage of people physically suffering the impact of chemical agents, apparently sarin gas. Hours later, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said Netanyahu had told him on the telephone that he was not in a position to confirm Brun's statement. It is hard to imagine the U.S. was taken by surprise by Brun's statement. Just the day before, Brun briefed visiting U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel on Syria. It is not possible he failed to mention the same information. And of course, it isn't just the IDF saying that Syrian President Bashar Assad is using chemical weapons. The British and the French are also saying this. But as a European source told Maev, the Americans don't want to know the facts. The facts will make them do something about serious, serious chemical weapons, and they don't want to do anything about serious chemical weapons. So they forced Netanyahu to, to disown his own intelligence. Thursday afternoon, in a speech in Abu Dhabi, Hegel confirmed, with some degree of varying confidence, unquote, that Syria used chemical weapons at least on a small scale. What the administration, that's the Obama administration, means by some degree of varying confidence is, of course, unknowable with any degree of varying, conf varying confidence. And here's Ambas or, uh, Secretary of Defense Hegel speaking in Abu Dhabi. I want to read a statement because I think this is going to consume most of your attention as it has the last uh, couple of days. Uh, this morning, the White House delivered, delivered a letter to several members of Congress on the topic of chemical weapons use in Syria. The letter states that the U.S. intelligence community assesses with some degree of varying confidence that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons on a small scale in Syria, specifically the chemical agent sarin. As I've said, the intelligence community has been assessing information for some time on this issue, and the decision to reach this conclusion was made within the past 24 hours. Then there is a rant. Also on Tuesday, the former head of IDF military intelligence said that Iran has already crossed the red line Israel set last year. Indeed, the U.S. has allowed Iran to cross the nuclear threshold while requiring Israel to pretend the course the U.S. has followed is a responsible one. The announcement that the U.S. has agreed to sell Israel advanced weapons specifically geared towards attacking Iran should also be seen in this light. 
Israel reportedly spent a year negotiating this deal, but immediately after its details were published, the U.S. started backing away from its supposed commitment to supply them. The U.S. will not provide Israel with bunker buster bombs, and anyway, by the time Israel gets the items the U.S. is selling, like mid-air refuelers, it will be too late. In other words, Iran will already have the bomb, and it won't be possible to go take out their nuclear facilities. She continues, never in U.S. history has there been a greater misuse and abuse of U.S. intelligence agencies than there is today under the Obama administration. Take the Boston Marathon bombings. Each day, more and more reports come out about the information U.S. agencies had for years regarding the threat posed by the Boston Marathon bombers. Now, one of the things you may not know about these bombers is that if you go back about a year and a half, September 11th, 2011, that is the 10th anniversary of 9-11. In Waltham, Massachusetts, three young men in their 20s, I believe one might have been in his 30s, were brutally murdered, murdered in a house there. They had their throats slashed. Now, this is something that's not been covered very much by the press, but the Boston terrorist who was killed uh, when the police went to arrest him is now suspected of having committed these murders. The interesting thing about these three men that you probably don't know and that the press has not covered is that these three men were Jewish. So here we have a man who committed a terrorist act by all accounts who may also have slaughtered three Jews in Boston, Massachusetts on the anniversary of 9-11. Next, I wanna play a clip uh, where um, Glenn Beck plays a clip from MSNBC discussing the Boston terrorists and their relationship to a certain religion. Uh, and standard Glenn Beck, disclaimers apply, Pray for Glenn's salvation, but Glenn does make some good observations. And so here is a clip from Glenn Beck the other day, playing a clip from MSNBC, talking about stereotyping the bombers, the terrorists. The media is trying to figure out what exactly happened. They're trying definitely not to uh, blame radical Islam. But while they're doing that, they're failing to cover something else. And I only have time for one story. So I'll show you, uh, I'll show you one on one side. Uh, this one, first of all, is the, there was a, a Muslim man and a, and a crowd of Muslims that attacked a Jewish man. So I'll show you his um, arrest here after attacking. And this, this crowd surrounded this poor Jewish man. Uh, and then I'll show you uh, MSNBC because I, I just think I only have time for one. You can watch them both together brother we get all kinds of tweets from his friends he seems pretty so like i think part of the answer is that it's still an open question but it does worry me when even as we still have these open questions we are already beginning to talk about it as a policy matter. well see that's the important point here because no, they don't have you don't know they're, they're talking about um uh, how uh, anti-muslim hate crimes have soared by 50 percent um, in 2010. Go ahead, keep it blanks. up. We fill in the blanks with the right. stereotypes. We fill in the blanks with the profiles. We fill in the blanks with what makes us feel most comfortable that this is an exceptional, extraordinary case that happened because they are this. So he doesn't so like it when the media points things element. out like you're Muslim or you're a Tea Party member or something like that. And that's it's interesting. We'll have to get to the Muslim, uh, the Muslims uh, surrounding the Jewish man uh, some other time. You're going to have to decide what the truth is but you stay involved. Well, we do appreciate MSNBC for bringing to the front the kind of crazy analysis that goes on in the left. It's pretty clear what motivated these terrorists. It's just that we're not allowed to talk about it anymore. Uh, back to Caroline Glick, where she's talking about that this is the unprecedented in history, a president misusing US intelligence. But how could the FBI have acted, possibly acted on those threats? Obama has outlawed all discussion or study of jihad, Islamism, radical Islam, and the Quran by U.S. federal government agencies. The only law enforcement agency that monitors Islamic websites is the NYPD. And its chief, Ray Kelly, has bravely maintained his policy despite pressure to end his surveillance operations. And in fact, this, this week, I believe it was the New York Times, received a Pulitzer Prize for having 
uh, written an art, a series of articles critical of Commissioner Kelly, Chief Kelly, and the NYPD. All the while, he is protecting the people of New York. Everywhere else, Caroline continues, officials are barred from discussing the threat posed by jihadists or even acknowledging they exist. People were impressed that Obama referred to the terrorist attack in Boston as a terrorist attack. Sidebar comment, not necessarily. The people at MSNBC were upset, saying that President Obama used that word because he ranted about what had happened in Boston and did not act rationally. They don't even want to call it what it is. Uh, because according to the administration dictated federal, federal lexicon, the use of the word terrorism is forbidden particularly when the act in question was perpetrated by Muslims. Then there are the Palestinians. So she's talked about uh, the jihad problem. She's talked about Syria. She's talked about Iran. Now she's turning to the Palestinians. Then there are the Palestinians. On Thursday, it was reported that in the midst of everything happening in the Middle East, Obama is planning to host a peace conference in Washington in June to reinstate negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. The terms of reference for the conference are reportedly the 2002 Arab League Peace Plan, also called uh, an initiative. Among other things, that plan requires Israel to accept millions of hostile foreign-born Arabs. This is what is refer referenced to as the right of return to accept millions of hostile foreign-born Arabs to whatever rump state it retains following a peace agreement with the PLO in exchange for Israel agreeing to destroy itself. And this is why I appreciate the honesty of Caroline Glick. In exchange for Israel agreeing to destroy itself, the Arab peace plan says the Arabs will agree to have regular, quote, unquote, relations with Israel. Regular, by the way, is a term devoid of meaning. During his visit here last week, Speaking of Israel, Kerry announced that the new U.S. policy towards the Palestinians is to pour billions of dollars into the Palestinian economy. Among other things, the administration is going to convince U.S. companies like Coca-Cola to open huge plants in Judea and Samaria. Sounds fine, but as usual, there is a catch. The administration wants U.S. firms to build their factories in Area C. I'll explain that in just a moment the area of Judea and Samaria over which, in accordance with the agreements they signed with Israel, the Palestinians agreed Israel should hold sole control. And here's the ministers of the Arab League uh, meeting in 2002, at which time they announced the Arab Peace Initiative, adopted by the 14th Arab Summit in Beirut, Lebanon, March 2002. And it talks about what will be necessary for the Arab League the 57 Arab and Muslim countries to establish full diplomatic and normal relations in Israel. Again, it talks about the right of return and ending the occupation. Now, this is a map of the area that Caroline Glick correctly refers to as Judea and Samaria. This is the biblical heartland of Israel. This is the area where Abraham and his family first sojourned when they came from uh, Ur, they settled in the hill country in the area of today known as Judea and Samaria. Now, what Area C is, the area that the Arab peace plant or the, that carry is pushing the United States to allow plants to be built in Area C is the gray area. That is the area that, excuse me, that is the area that Israel would retain under any peace agreement because the west bank of the Jordan River, which is the gray area, area C that you see, is an area that they need as a buffer zone to prevent terrorists and other people who don't have Israel at their best, Israel's uh, heart, or Israel's, area C is the area the West Bank of the Jordan River that Israel needs as a buffer zone to prevent terrorists from coming into Israel. And that is the area that the Obama administration says the Palestinians should be allowed to build plants. Area C is the area where, when you hear about Jewish settlers, they live in Area C. 
and by any stretch of the imagination, Israel is going to have to maintain Area C for it to have any kind of a um, for it to have any kind of possibility of survival. So back to Caroline Glick. In essence, the policy Kerry announced is simply an American version of the EU's policy of seeking to force Israel to give up control over Area C. Area C, of course, is where all the Israeli communities are and almost no Palestinians live. Those Israeli communities and the 350,000 Jews who live in them are the strongest assertion of Israeli sovereign rights to Judea and Samaria. So the EU and now the Americans are doing everything they can to force Israel to destroy them. The campaign to coerce Israel into surrendering its control, sole control over Area C is a central component of that plan. It cannot be set often enough. The administration, that's the Obama administration's focus on the Palestinian conflict with Israel in the midst of the violent disintegration of the Arab state system and the rise of jihadist forces throughout the region, coupled with Iran's steady emergence as a regional power, is only understandable in the framework of a psychiatric rather than a policy analysis. Contrary to the constant grinding rhetorical prattle of American and Israeli politicos, Obama will not lift a finger to stop Iran from becoming a nuclear power. He will not lift a finger... Contrary to the constant grinding rhetorical prattle of... Contrary to the constant grinding rhetorical prattle of American and Israeli politicos, Obama will not lift a finger to stop Iran from becoming a nuclear power. He will not lift a finger to prevent chemical weapons from being transferred to the likes of Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah and their colleagues in Syria or used by the Syrian regime. From Benghazi to Boston, from Tehran to Damascus, Obama's policy is not to fight forces of jihad, whether they are individuals, organizations, or states. And his obsession with Palestinian statehood shows that he would rather coerce Israel to make concessions to Palestinian Jew haters and terrorists rather than devote his time and energy into preventing Iran from becoming the jihadist North Korea or from keeping sarin, VX, and mustard gas out of the hands of Iran's terrorist underlings and their Sunni competitors. No, Israel doesn't want a confrontation with Washington, but we don't have any choice anymore. Time has come to take matters into our own hands on Syria and Iran. In Syria, either Israel takes care of the chemical weapons, or if we can't, Netanyahu must go before the cameras and tell the world everything we know about Syria's chemical weapons and pointedly demand world, that is the U.S., action to, this, to secure them. And so this is the situation, the deteriorating situation in Syria. I just reported just a few minutes before I came up here to speak tonight, this report that Israeli aircraft are spotted over Assad's palace in Damascus. Now, I don't have any confirmation other than this report on this Israeli website. This is what Caroline Glick says. As for Iran, ask yourself a question is, why would these Israeli, Israeli plans be, uh, Israeli planes be buzzing around Assad's palace in Damascus. I think I have an answer for you in just a moment. Here's Caroline Glick. As for Iran, either Israel must launch an attack without delay, or if we can't, then Netanyahu has to publicly state that the time for diplomacy is over. Either Iran is attacked or it gets the bomb. And here's a confidant of Netanyahu. This was on Joel Rosenberg's blog the other day. Former IDF Intel chief says Tehran will be able to break out the bomb this summer and calls for drastic increase in sanctions. He thinks that, is, that Iran has already gone past that so-called red line. And so will we see this? Will we see Israeli, fly, Israeli planes flying in to, is, to Iran to attack it, to take out their nuclear facilities? I would suggest to you that the Israeli planes flying over the palace in Damascus may be an attempt to test the capabilities of Syrian anti-aircraft radar and weapons uh, as a precursor to an attack, a later attack on Iran. 
That's just speculation on my part. I don't know if that's the case, but it's certainly something that bears watching. And so what you see here from just this week again is further proof that all the nations are lining up just like the Bible said that they would. And all the nations are lining up against Israel. Even the United States is lining up against Israel now, it appears. I think this will bring God's judgment on us. Next week, we'll look at Revelation 17. One of the things that we should learn from prophecy is that God lays out patterns. Jesus used this. He said, if you want to know what's going to happen before I return, look at the days of Noah. If you want to know what's going to happen before I return, look at the days of Lot. If you want to know about the final kingdom of the beast, the final kingdom that opposes God, look at the first kingdom that opposed God. And we'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the prophecies that give us so much information so that we can know about the soon return of the Lord. And Father, I pray, I pray that we would be like Daniel, who in his time saw that prophecy was about to be fulfilled, and he went and prayed that prophecy would be fulfilled. And Lord, I pray that we pray that your prophetic word would come to pass that your plan would be fulfilled completely and to your glory. And now, Father, use that information in our lives to motivate us to live holy, sanctified lives, waiting for the coming of Yeshua, the Messiah, our coming King, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.